few slides. Yeah, we're going to start today with Charlotte introducing just six slides as a sort of backdrop, and then we'll be in, in dialogue, we'll be in discussion. And I'm delighted, Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us and the platform's yours. Well, thanks to both Sue and to Helen for such a lovely welcome. And I don't intend to spend a lot of time on the slides because I know that the conversation with Helen is going to be the most exciting part of this presentation. But I just wanted, before we began talking about uh, Sarah Delano Roosevelt and Jenny Jerome Churchill, to give you a sense of what they looked like so you have an image of them in your head. And also to explain that the reason I found them so interesting and I paired them was that these two Victorian women were both Americans and both born within a few miles of each other in the same year. When I discovered this, I thought, what chance is it that the mothers of the two of the great statesmen of the 20th century would have such similar origins? So here they are. There's Sarah as a young woman. You can see how um, beautifully dressed she is and composed. And there's Jenny, a much more amb ambiguous expression on her face. And um, you can see there's a bit of mischief there already. So they were bo both born into the upper class of uh, Manhattan in 1854, very wealthy, entitled families, but it wasn't quite the same, same slice of society they were born into. The Delanos were establishment. They um, assumed they belonged everywhere and they were welcomed everywhere. Whereas the Jeromes were nouveau riche. Jenny's father had made his fortune by um, sheer nerve and quite a lot of insider trading. And so from that moment onwards, their paths actually did diverge. Although interestingly, they were both, they both had very exotic uh, childhoods. And um, Sarah for at one point was in China for a couple of years with her family. Jenny moved to Paris with her mother uh, when she was a young teenager and they were cosmopolitan, um, bilingual or trilingual, and they were both in Paris at the same time because that's where rich Americans went. Their choices in... Shall I go on to the next slide? Yes, please. Yeah. Their choices generally uh, diverged at every stage, and yet they followed the same pattern so that um, they both, in fact, married men that took their parents, their own families, by surprise. Jenny married Lord Randolph Churchill, who was the second son of the Duke of Marlborough. There's a picture of Marlborough. I expect many of you have had a chance to visit this magnificent stately home in, in uh, near Oxford in England. It's magnificent, but it's also incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and there's Lord Randolph, who was frankly a quite arrogant young man, but it was a love match. They got engaged about three days after they'd first met, to the horror of um, Jenny's mother, because uh, she thought Jenny at 19 was far too young. And it started off as the most wonderful affair, quite a steamy affair, because they got married in um, April and uh, Winston was born seven months later. Jenny, Sarah, in contrast, this is her husband, if we could have the next slide, um, James Roosevelt, who was actually twice her age. He was a neighbor in the Hudson Valley in New York, um, a, a sort of enclave of upper-class New, New Yorkers. He was the same age as her father, and her father thought that he was visiting the, the um, Delano family to talk to him. And in fact, he was there to talk to Warren Delano's daughter, who was by then 26, and everybody had assumed would never marry. Um, it was a very happy marriage, um, nothing like as steamy as uh, the Churchill marriage. And what these two women have in common, again, is that um, their husbands both died young. So the two women were widows for a long time, which gave them another set of choices of how to handle single life after the death of your spouse. The other big contrast between them, if we could have the next slide, is uh, how they reared their children. Here's Jenny with uh, Winston and her younger son, Jack. She had two sons. She followed the pattern in the initial years of um, 
the aristocratic British pattern of leaving her children's care to nannies and maids and then sending Winston and then Jack off very early to boarding schools. It was not a huge success. And Winston spent the whole time craving her attention, begging her to come and visit him. It wasn't actually until he was in his late teens and Jenny was widowed that uh, she really began to focus on him. And she, as you can see from the way she's looking at the camera, she's quite a lively woman who's very conscious of the impact she's having on others. In contrast, and if we could have the next slide, um, Sarah was the most doting mother. She'd walked today, we'd call a helicopter parent. She rarely let Franklin out of her sight. She uh, wept when she had to cut off his baby curls. When he finally left home, first of all, to go to boarding school, she um, insisted he write twice a week. And if he didn't write, she'd call the principal of the school and say, uh, is he sick? And when he went to Harvard, she took an apartment in Boston, close to Cambridge, where Mass, where Harvard is, just so she could keep an eye on him. And you can see from her expression and the way that their bodies, their hands are entwined, that um, she is not so uh, conscious of having to make a good impression. She is uh, equally well-dressed, equally as attractive in many ways as Jenny, but uh, much more um, dignified. So these are the two mothers, the two very different mothering styles. And then just to remind you what's extraordinary, if we could have the last slide, please. These, this is the great friendship between their sons. And what I suggest in the book is that the way this friendship developed and the dynamics of it was very much direct, uh, based on the emotional tactics. Each of these men had learnt when dealing with the formidable women who were their mothers. Churchill had a particular sort of emotional, needy style. Um, very, I mean, everybody agrees that Churchill would burst into tears at the first uh, instance of anything that frustrated him. He had temper tantrums. He was a um, very demanding personality and liked and very intense, whereas Roosevelt, who had had this intrusive mother who rarely let him out of her sight, he had developed a way of dealing with um, personal relationships where he smiled and was absolutely charming, um, but he kept others at arm's length. He was seen as quite aloof. So that was the, those are the images I want to present before Helen and I start our conversation. Thank you Great, so much. Charlotte. Thank you. So we'll start our, our conversation. The book's magnificent. And before we dive into some of the questions, we were chatting a little bit earlier, how you really got into the writing uh, when you first came to Canada, how you started your particular journey, because it's extraordinary, the Canadian history that you've written about. So do you just want to say something very briefly, which of course that then leads into the book that you've just written? Well, in fact, this is my 12th book um, and the previous books all had at one level, they were either exclusively about Canadians or they had a Canadian angle. So my books have been published outside as Canada as well, because they, for example, one is a biography of Alexander Graham Bell. But the interest there was that uh, he had a summer home in Canada, in Cape Breton, or I did a book about the Yukon Gold Rush uh, following seven characters. And in fact, most of those characters were not Canadian, but the event was Canadian. Why did I start writing about Canadian history? Well, I spent the first sort of 15 years of my life here writing about Canadian politics, about which I knew absolutely nothing when I arrived. Most Brits don't. And I found it very interesting. I wrote about it because I live in Ottawa. So there wasn't much else to write about. Um, but I was so curious all the time about how did this country get jammed together? How, you know, what, what's the origin of Canada? And I looked around for the kind of books I wanted to read. I simply couldn't find them. There were some wonderful popular histories, particularly I'm remembering the ones by Pierre Burton, 
But all Pierre Burton's book are about manly tasks like building railroads across a great nation. And there was nothing about people, how people actually lived or what women's lives were like. And given that so many of the pioneer farms were dependent on the women's labor, that's yeah. what I wanted to learn about. So I couldn't find them, so I started writing about them. It's just wonderful that you did. And so how did you come to these two women? I mean, they were confident, wealthy, I mean, utterly fascinating. But you've paired these two together, as you said earlier. And, and why did you make that choice? I mean, it's a fascinating, I mean, it's an, on one level, it's an obvious choice because of the two powerful men behind them, their sons, but I just think it's fantastic. I mean, how did you get to write write about them? Well, I started off re realising there was this coincidence. I can't remember how I realised both of them were born in 1854 and so in a, very close to each other um, and thought, you know, how likely is it that uh, these two women who had such powerful sons had this coincidence? And I also realized that they were seen exclusively through the lens of being mothers of famous sons mm. and often through a very negative lens because yeah. I was reading biographies of um, FDR and Winston Churchill and the biographers, rather predominantly men, were often very dismissive of them. And they were aided in this, in fact, by Winston Churchill himself, who wrote of Jenny, um, she twinkled for me um, like the evening star, but I, lo I loved her, but at a distance. Because Winston Churchill, when he wrote that in a book about his early life, he was keen to show that he'd sort of sprung fully formed as this extraordinary hero. And Sarah was regarded very negatively because her daughter-in-law, after Sarah's death and the death of Franklin Roosevelt as well, uh, she became this huge figure who has huge uh, impact on society, big supporter of uh, progressive causes, of peace, of United mm. Nations. And, but she had had a very difficult relationship with her mother-in-law, Sarah Roosevelt, and she wrote three memoirs, each of which was more negative about her mother-in-law. And Roosevelt biographers had lapped up her side of the story and never thought of Sarah's. And I wanted to look at these two women, not sort of in retrospect in the rear view mirror like that, but also sort of trace them through their own writings and their own experiences, mm. because they were more than mothers. And and what about the choices that they made? Because this is something you're very strong on, of course, you know, into their early adulthood. And we'll come on to their marriages shortly. But do you want to speak to, to, to that aspect, some of the early choices they made? Because it, it does seem, I mean, extraordinary in the era that they're living in, that they you know, they'd be, be perfect in a modern world, in a way, career women. But then life was so limited for women. You know, even women in high society, to be honest, had a very kind of closed, very privileged, but nevertheless, very restraining. And yeah, they, these two women are sort of bursting out of this constraint. It is quite extraordinary. So what about those early choices that they made? Well, I think... One really has to time travel back to uh, the 1850s, 60s, 70s when they're growing up. Because, of course, we look back now and think, oh, my God, they had so few choices, you know, no mm. edu not much education, no careers. They didn't think of it that way. They didn't think they were marginal to a patriarchal society. They oh. thought that was how the world worked. And they were going to exert their choices in the space provided. So... Um, and they were also, from the start, such different personalities. It was obvious that Sarah was quite conventional and traditional. She adored her family, um, but she was also quite independent. She was happy as a, a young teenager to go off by herself to a boarding school in Germany, um, which she didn't need to do. And similarly, Jenny was this gregarious extrovert who was in Paris and one of the things that she spent a lot of time on was music. She was a gifted pianist, concert pianist, and also flirting. And um, 
So you get this big contrast in their uh, personalities during the uh, their adolescent years. I mean, they were still very much sort of dominated by their families and their families' choices. But uh, they showed a spirit, both of them, that mm -hmm. uh, revealed that, you know, that they were not going to be pushed around. I know. I love these two women. They're extraordinary. And I want to just ask you, a bit about their sons, because we'll sort of move around, not necessarily chronological, because after all, this is a an after dinner chat that we're having. Um, how did they actually build relationships with their sons? Because in many ways, it could, well, I suppose on one level, you would say they're, they're quite suffocating, each in their own way. And yet the sons handled them quite well I think given that so do you want to talk to us something about how they built their relationships with their sons well as I mentioned earlier when I was showing the pictures of them with their sons um motherhood meant a lot to both of them yeah and they were you know as most mothers are um devoted to their children for Sarah Delano Roosevelt Motherhood was one of the main planks of her existence because the birth of Franklin had been very, very difficult. And mm. in fact, they weren't sure that the baby, very big baby, 10 pounds, um, was actually even going to survive. And after the birth, the doctor said to Sarah that uh, she shouldn't have any more children. She'd probably, she came from a large family. She was probably hoping for more, I don't know. Um, but that meant that Franklin was her only child. And she'd also seen several nieces and nephews and others, the deaths, early deaths um, mm -hmm. of children, which were very common at that point. And so she was determined to protect this one precious child at all costs. And so she gave Franklin at one level, the most extraordinary childhood where he grew up in this marvelous on this marvelous estate overlooking the Hudson River and he was constantly protected encouraged in all his interests he was a great bird watcher he loved to he loved natural history he became a keen stamp collector and um collector also of uh pictures ships and um marine art um his parents encouraged him throughout and he never mentally left Springwood the home in the in Hyde Park in the in the Hudson Valley that was always his haven throughout his life particularly when he was president and living at the White House um similarly so so Sarah's attitude was that you know her job was to cherish mm -hmm. Franklin, and to make sure that he realized he was very special. In contrast, as I mentioned earlier, Jenny always had her own life. She didn't see motherhood as uh, her vacation. What happened with her was that increasingly it became harder and harder for her to spend time with her sons because her husband, Lord Randolph, was very demanding. The story mm. of that marriage is quite sad because Lord Randolph starts off by having a brilliant political career in Britain, and then it goes very sour, very quick, quickly, and he resigns from cabinet. It turns out that he was actually very ill, probably syphilis, and yeah. he had a long, slow, debilitating um, death uh, or illness to, to his death, and he became an increasingly erratic and difficult to live with. He would never appear to love his, either of his sons at all. He was particularly hard on Winston, who it has mm -hmm. to be said was a really bumptious youngster and who was always careless and losing money and overspending his allowance and getting into trouble. His father wrote him unbelievably cruel letters, mm -hmm. all of which have survived. And Winston, Jenny spent a lot of time sort of Protecting wisdom, protecting Winston from his father's rages, not until his father died in 1895, when Winston was actually 21 by then. Not until then did um, Jenny was Jenny able to really focus on him, and at that point, 
they develop a relationship. I mean, there's only 20 years between them. They develop a relationship, which is almost like brother and sister. They were sort of competing because both wanted to earn money by their pens, both um, wanted to, to maintain networks of powerful friends. And Jenny had throughout imbued Winston in the same way as Sarah had imbued Franklin with the feeling that he was special, he was going to be a leader. Jenny had done the same with Winston. She always wrote to him when he was uh, out of the country, I, you're born under a lucky star. Uh, I know there are great things waiting for you. So both these women gave their sons a special sense of they were going to be uh, extraordinary leaders, but they did it in a quite different way. Yeah, because that was my next question, actually, about how far they shaped the sons in the sense towards leadership, because it's one thing to have great expectations, which all mothers do of their sons and their children, don't they? You're, going, you're destined for greatness. Uh, greatness doesn't always come. But in I'm not speaking about my own family, but in, um, you know, in so many cases, it doesn't happen in quite the extraordinary way as these two men. And I was thinking when I was reading the book, uh, had you thought about pairing those two and writing about them as a follow-on because I think give, on the back of the mothers this is absolutely fascinating to ha to have your eyes uh, on material because of the way they've been portrayed largely by male authors there's a lot in that sorry <laughs> well no I, the, the point I wanted to make <clears throat> and I'm I'm glad you you just made the point you did the point I wanted to make was that along with sort of helping build the kind of super egos that mm. politicians need, you know, the thick skin, the strong ego, yeah. the, the drive. These women helped in very practical ways. So Sarah helped Franklin Roosevelt with money. Sarah Delano Roosevelt had inherited two fortunes. The Delano fortune was bigger than the Roosevelt fortune, but she was a very, very well-off woman, one of the wealthiest in America. And um, she didn't want Franklin to go into politics. She thought politics was a rather dirty business. She wanted him to be a sort of dignified country gentleman. But once Franklin decided he was uh, going to run for office in, first of all, for the New York Assembly, she um, bankrolled him. And she continued bankrolling all his uh, political campaigns, and there were many. Um, and she also subsidized the um, Roosevelt expenses when they lived in the White House, uh, because the president's salary didn't cover the expenses of the White House. It was assumed there would be private money. So she helped a little bit with connections, but mainly with money. She believed in him. And as soon as, in fact, as soon as he was elected and he became quite prominent, she stopped referring to po politicians. And she said, well, of course, Franklin's a statesman. Yes. In contrast, Jenny had no money. Jenny was incredibly uh, extravagant. She was always in debt. She had horrible uh, obligations to um, uh, money lenders. And she couldn't help Winston with money, which would have been enormously advant advantageous to him. What she could help him with was her phenomenal network within the power circles of London, the editors of all the major newspapers, most of the most of the members of cabinet, including the prime minister, um, senior members of the armed forces, because he starts off, Winston, going to Sandhurst Military yeah. College and then going into the army. So she was absolutely crucial in having little dinner parties and introducing him to people and keeping his name in front of uh, powerful others. I mean, I love Winston said she left no wire unpulled, no stone unturned, no cutlet ungrilled. Uh, she was, um, she worked very hard on his behalf. Yeah. And of course, another aspect of the book, you've got, you've got the women as a sort of the main subject, but in the background, interestingly, and this is an aspect I found fascinating when I was reading it, you have what's going on in the wider world with, with empire, the industrialization in the United States, the whole sort of enslaved enslavement on which uh, that industry is built. Do you want to, to say a little bit about that at this stage? Well, I think, it, you know, 
to go back to the, you know, our uh, first opening conversation, I wanted, when I was trying to understand Canadian history, I've always understood history through biography and social history, but mm -hmm. just writing very narrowly about lives, particularly women's lives, if they tend to be sort of domestic, it doesn't really tell you about the larger context. So I've always tried very hard to integrate foreground and background. And in this case, I actually don't think I'd have, if I'd known now what it involved in terms of reading, uh, I'm not sure I would have undertaken it because it was massive. I mean, yeah. those books behind me aren't even the beginning of all the books I had to read to get up to speed on everything. But of course, both women's lives were actually dominated by the social changes and the political changes during their life. Because what was happening between their births in 1854 and their deaths in the 20th century was that America was slowly attaining the position of being the superpower, uh, in the global superpower, while the British Empire was in trouble and was shrinking. And mm -hmm. it was reflected in their lives. And they themselves also were part of, you know, changing mores. I mean, I always think that um, the 1920s, uh, which is such a sort of break post First World War, such a break in style and suddenly a lot of the Victorian uh, restrictions and prejudices were dropped and women, they let go of their corsets. They started dancing Charleston. In fact, Jenny, Jenny, unfortunately died uh, in 1921, but she would have loved all that. She was a woman ready for the 20th century. Whereas Sarah, very rather starchy, very traditional, um, she would not have approved of such behavior. And so she really more belongs to the 18th century. And I wanted to sort of bring out those kind of um, changes and the changes to, as you know, Britain moves into a different era of politics and the United States just keeps growing. It's the economy just keeps swelling and uh, the state and the, the states is attracting more and more immigrants. And you just have the sense there of the energy and the entrepreneurial uh, successes and how different that society is becoming. And of course, in contrast to Jenny, Sarah, in fact, becomes, if you like, the dominant partner, doesn't she, in the marriage? You know, all this going on and the social changes, and she's she's really, would well, you think she was born too early in many ways? Well, one of the things that I found fascinating was that um, I mentioned that she didn't really like Franklin going into politics, and he was always a Democrat, as his father had been, but Sarah was actually born into a Republican family. She didn't really sort of approve of government taking over a whole lot of social welfare programs. And when um, Roosevelt was elected president in 1932, a lot of people, certainly Republicans and some centrist Democrats, were shocked because uh, they regarded Roosevelt, and especially mouthy wife of his, Eleanor, as socialists, you know, that they were they were shocked at the election to the White House, the arrival in the White House of somebody who seemed determined to um, spend government money on um, veterans and the poor. And, but interestingly, the week of the inauguration, who appeared on the front cover of Time magazine? Not the new president, Sarah, his, mother was on the cover of Time magazine. Why? Because she actually represented reassurance to all those doubters. She represented the really sort of traditional continuity of American government, the belief that in small government, the um, att attachment to the old values. She was a reassurance for those who felt that the country was changing too fast. Yeah, she's interesting, that sort of stable, that that rock, sort of a patriarchal, stable uh, woman. And, of course, here on Classy Lectures, we absolutely love the royal links. So I want to ask you about Jenny and Edward, Prince of Wales, who was, of course, Queen Victoria's eldest son, to put this in perspective, and heir to the throne. 
So he was totally captivated by her, wasn't he? I mean, how did they meet? I know that she's moving in high society, but can you give us a flavour? I mean, I mean, you might move in high society, but it's not everyone that just meets a prince and then has a relationship. So can you tell us what, you know, the extent of the relationship? Tell us a little bit about that royal connection. Of course, the royal connection is fascinating. And Jenny played it for all it was worth. She had met the Prince of Wales uh, in the Isle of Wight because he went there regularly um, for the uh, Cows Regatta, a big deal at the Royal Yacht Club there. He was a great sailor. And um, he also, by the time she met him in the uh, 1870s, he was uh, already, he was married to the Princess Alexandria, but already had a reputation as a playboy um, and somebody who was totally loyal to his wife, but not faithful. And she um, met him at various parties. The other thing that was true of um, the Prince of Wales was that he loved American women. He thought that they were so much more interesting than British ones. They dressed better. They were better educated. And they, someone like Jenny, who was extremely witty, made him laugh in a way that sort of deferential daughters of dukes didn't do. Yeah. And so they had met at various parties at the um, the Royal Yacht Club. And um, he was also a great friend of uh, Lord Randolph Churchill's. So they got to know each other quite well. The nature of their relationship, I, th I think it's pretty clear they had a physical relationship. And it's pretty clear actually that uh, many people knew about it. But he had lots of physical relationships with all kinds of people, all kinds of women. And um, but Jenny was always special to him because they also had a very solid friendship. And um, as I said, she made him laugh. And he remained loyal to her right until his death in 1910, after, including while he was king. And what's interesting about Jenny is that she's the kind of woman... She's more than just a courtesan because she, women liked her as well as men. She became quite a confidant of uh, Alexandria, who went, including when Alexandria became the queen. Uh, she would go and stay with them in Norfolk, and um, she and the queen would sort of disappear to the queen's boudoir uh, for private chats. So you you get the sense of Jenny as this lively, gregarious, flirtatious, funny woman, but who's also gracious to everybody. And both of them widowed, so they're not, you know, quite young. Do you want to comment on that and how that really affected them in different ways? Yes. I mean, the thing I realise, having written a lot now about women at different stages in their lives, is that... Um, if they're very good looking and then when they hit uh, sort of 30s, 40s, they start losing their looks. For some mm. women, it's absolutely of no interest at all because they've got their lives and they're just going to get on with them. For women like Jenny, who, are, um, who were really shaped by the male gaze, who really um, found being the most beautiful woman in the room... Um, an important element in their personality. That's really hard, where you suddenly realize that, you know, you're passe. Um, similarly, widowhood, for some women, it actually is sort of just the next chapter of your life. It's the next, uh, there's always, obviously, or in most cases, the grief of losing a beloved partner. And this is true of Sarah. She was genuinely grief stuck, struck when um, James died, uh, it took a while for her to get over it. She was a strong personality and she had Franklin and she didn't need another husband. I mean, she was wealthy and good looking, but there's no suggestion of somebody else in her life. So she um, turned all her attention and those sort of that blowtorch of uh, ambition onto her son. And she wrote about James for the first few months, how your dear father would be proud of you, kind of things in her letters. But very soon, you know, she's autonomous and she's enjoying life. She's traveling. She goes to Paris regularly to stay with her sister. 
she sees a lot of the Roosevelt family, Franklin and Eleanor, and looks after their children a great deal. But uh, she's actually quite enjoying widowhood, single life. Jenny, in contrast, finds widowhood a huge relief once Lord Randolph has died because he had been so impossible in the last months. It was just, and she, as soon as she is widowed, instead of staying in London where <sighs> she had to behave like Queen Victoria and wear a black veil head to toe and not uh, go out to parties, two months later, she's in Paris having a good time and uh, having um, relationships with the uh, new new fans, uh, new adoring men. But for her, widowhood is not such a comfortable state. First of all, she doesn't have a lot of money. She needs somebody to help um, support her lifestyle. But also she, she loves having a man around. I mean, she is a um, somebody who's uh, gregarious and used to having somebody dancing attendance on her. Sarah will marry twice more, both to men who are the same age as Winston. So there's Sarah married a man twice her age. Jenny married two men who were half her age, one after the other, I hasten to add. Um, <laughs> so widowhood, they handled widowhood completely differently, but both of them as widows enjoyed making their own choices because once in Imperial London or in Manhattan, once you were a widow, you had a status, um, you were able to own property at that stage and you um, you could have much more freedom than a single woman could. Mm. And what about, you know, these very powerful women who are self-assured, what about their relationship with their daughter-in-laws? Daughter I'm dying very to good ask question. you. <laughs> well, well, deal quickly with Jenny's, with Clementine Churchill. Winston had seen his mother um, flirtatious, lively. He was very proud of her, always intensely loyal to her. Uh, but he married a woman who Jenny approved of enormously, uh, Clementine. And uh, that was a very solid, loyal marriage. None of the fireworks that were in the marriage between his parents. And that was a relationship, his relationship with Clementine, which answered his need for constant emotional um, security. Uh, but it was solid. And Clementine, to begin with, uh, found her mother-in-law absolutely exasperating. <laughs> Winston and Clementine went off on holiday, on honeymoon. Um, Jenny moved in and redecorated Clementine's bedroom. And Clementine hated what she'd done to it because there were satin bows everywhere. Um, so uh, to begin with, she was exasperated by it. But then uh, she grew to admire Jenny's sheer spirit and her um, resilience. In contrast, the relationship between Sarah and her daughter-in-law, Eleanor, was much more complicated. Mm. Franklin shocked his mother, who thought she knew everything about her beloved son's life. Franklin shocked her when he suddenly announced one Thanksgiving that he was engaged to his distant culinary cousin, Eleanor Roosevelt. And this was a disappointment to Sarah. She was thinking that Franklin in his early 20s was going to be the most delightful companion for her. Then she realized that Eleanor was actually um, a deer in the headlights. She had no idea sort of how to uh, manage a household, what marriage involved. She was socially inept. Uh, she herself, Eleanor, had a wretched childhood. It couldn't have been more different from the pampered existence that Franklin had had. So in the early years of marriage, Eleanor was so dependent on her mother-in-law because Sarah helped her find a house, find servants. Eleanor then spent about 10 years having children. She had six altogether, one of whom died, um, mm. and was constantly exhausted or ill. Sarah was always ready to scoop up the children and take them back to Hyde Park, look after them there, to come down to um, London, to um, Manhattan or to Washington, wherever the Roosevelts were living, and sort of move in and make sure everything was going fine. Sarah, so Eleanor started off pathetically grateful to uh, her mother-in-law, but gradually as she herself began to emerge and discover what she liked doing, Eleanor didn't enjoy being a mother. 
But she was a very competent woman who did enjoy volunteer activities, running an army um, refreshments uh, mm -hmm. canteen, um, heading up committees. She was very good at it, taking part in her husband's political campaigns. And that gave her confidence. And then she really frankly got fed up of Eleanor being too intrusive. And the relationship between Eleanor and Sarah became very, very strained. Mm. And how easy is it? Well, I would imagine it's quite difficult when you've got such famous characters to find new sources, new material. So can you give, can you give us a sense of, of the research, what was involved and the kind of places you visited to find new research, to find new material? I wish I'd visited about um, 50 more places than I had been able to visit because, of course, what struck a few months after I began writing this book, COVID, mm. COVID lockdowns. I had been planning to visit various Churchill sites uh, through Britain. I'd been planning to go to all the places that the Roosevelts had lived in uh, in the States. I couldn't even leave my uh, street in New Edinburgh, Ottawa, uh, because of the lockdowns. We were so um, constrained. So I was left with um, seeing what was available digitally. And then all the libraries were closed. So I became a huge uh, consumer of a secondhand bookstore, on online bookstore. I mean, I mean, I don't want to think about how much money I've spent there. Um, so, but what I did find was that because these two women came from such incredibly well-known families where there have been uh, has been a lot written about them, including wonderful edited collections of letters between mm. them and their sons or others and uh, uh, their, with others and comments in letters by others. Um, I was able to find the some of the original correspondence. And so that's where I went to try and see their lives through their eyes, not through their son's biographer's lives. When I finally, finally got to the archives, finally the lift downs were lifted, the, the, the um, restrictions were lifted, and I got to Churchill College to see the uh, Churchill papers and to the FDR Presidential Library in the Hudson Valley to see the Roosevelt papers. It was so exciting when I finally saw their handwriting because um, it was like sort of almost meeting them face to face. And it was so typical, you know, uh, Helen, because Jenny's handwriting, they both had learned sort of beautiful Victorian copper plate. Penmanship was such an a, important aspect of a, a woman's education then. But Sarah's, as you might predict, it stayed on the lines. It was very even and consistent, highly legible, and um, spoke somebody who stayed within the guardrails. Jenny's was um, scrawled all over the page, oblivious to the lines, sort of funny, shortened. Every time she said things like, your father is really cross with you. She, for a cross, she just put an X. Um, so you had to sort of learn how to uh, interpret some of the abbreviations. And it was typical of each woman, the way she wrote. And it was a thrill to actually sort of touch the paper that she had touched. I've just got a couple more questions before we open up for the audience because we want to allow others time to ask you questions. I mean, it's a fabulous book. It really is. You wouldn't get a sense of the challenges you've had in researching it because of COVID. It's absolutely, utterly brilliant. Is there a difference? This I'm interested in. Is there a difference in the way that these two women are viewed by British or American historians I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, is there a difference in the way that they're viewed? Um, well, first of all, you know, certainly when I've been speaking to audiences, American audiences want to hear about FDR and British audiences want to hear about Churchill. Um, I think that Jenny is better known as a personality and a lot of the sort of misogyny of the biographers 
is still carried on. People say things like, well, didn't she have too many affairs? And, um, you know, never looking at the fact that uh, when she did have affairs, and she didn't have nearly as many as uh, some of her enemies suggested, uh, when she did have affairs, they were very discreet. And often the men found their reputations enhanced while she was uh, slut shamed, frankly. Um, so, you know, you have to say, look, she's more than that. Yeah. In her own lifetime, she started a literary magazine. She raised funds for a national theater. She outfitted a hospital ship. She took all these initiatives, which were very unusual for an aristocratic woman of her time. Mm. Similarly with Sarah, people say, well, you know, wasn't she stuffy? Wasn't she just this sort of overwhelming, smothering mother? And again, you have to say, well, that might have been Eleanor Roosevelt's view. And certainly I wouldn't have wanted Sarah as my mother-in-law. But on the other hand, had it not been for Sarah, not only would the Roosevelt children have had an even more wretched childhood, because Franklin and Eleanor were not good parents, but also um, it's not sure that the Roosevelt marriage would have survived because mm -hmm. uh, when it was discovered that um, Franklin had had an affair in 1919, Eleanor, who was still at the sort of pathetic, um, passive aggressive stage of career character development said just, oh, if you want to divorce me, you can. And divorce at that stage was absolute mm -hmm. stigma. Um, Sarah said there's going to be no divorce in this family. She wasn't going to deal with the social stigma. But more than that, she didn't want her grandchildren, her five grandchildren, to grow up as in a broken home. So she sort of got this couple on the rails again. They never, I don't think they ever had a physical relationship after the discovery of the affair. But certainly they became the most wonderful partner, political partnership. Mm. It's utterly riveting. My final question, I'm going to be really cheeky and I hope you don't mind, but can I ask you, do you have a favourite amongst amongst either of them, like Sarah or Jenny, or is that is that a bit too cheeky to ask you? Oh, Helen, you know what it's like when you're writing a biography or a group biography. Your favourite is the one you're working on right now. You're so intrigued by the choices you're so, des not desperate, but so keen to find new information. Mm -hmm. You spend so much time thinking about them. It's not really a question of do you like them or not? Because if you didn't like them, you wouldn't be spending three or four years of your life researching them and writing about them. I have to say that, you know, if people say, well, which one would you have dinner with? I say, um, it's, it depends on my mood. If I'm feeling confident and optimistic and want a party, of course I'd go with Jenny because uh, she would sit down and play the piano. She would tell jokes. She was, one of the things she was very good at was being a listener. So she didn't always have to dominate the conversation. She really was interested in other people. So she would be fun and great. If I was having any kind of personal crisis, I know that Sarah would be rock solid Sarah would be the person who, you know, would sort of have um, views on uh, how to handle a situation. She'd have the stability and the security to say this too shall pass. So she'd be my friend at that stage. Fabulous answer. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand you back to Sue. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Helen, thank you. Thank that's been absolutely fantastic. So I want to encourage everyone to put their questions in the chat or hand up and I can unmute you. Um, I also want to remind everyone that the book is available through Ben McNally Books, whom we partner with. And please mention Classy Lectures if you buy there. It's certainly worth buying. I, I just want to ask a couple of questions. One is, um, what kind of influence do you think in terms of characteristics did they have on their sons? And Go ahead. I think I, I I mentioned this earlier, really. I think the way that their sons uh, behaved in in their close personal relationships was very much were very much dominated by or shaped by their that primal relationship with their mothers. It was very much shaped by um, the way that uh, they themselves had dealt with the 
lack of or surfeit of maternal affection. So that um, Franklin Roosevelt had developed this way of smiling and being charming and uh, always making whoever he was speaking to feeling really good without actually agreeing with him or showing his hand. He was a, a rather canny character, um, quite cool, quite cold in some length. Similarly, Churchill, who was always craving his mother's attention and who, who you know, sort of wanted people to love him uh, in the same, it was, you know, from those early years when he wanted Jenny to love him, he wanted Jenny's attention, he wanted her to come and visit him at boarding school. And part of that, of course, is nature. Uh, they were born with those personalities, but it's also nurture. It's what they learned as small boys. Fascinating. Thank you. And um, we've got a couple of questions. Let me just uh, see what we've got here. Um, Churchill's childhood nurse, Womany, acted as a surrogate mother and was a huge influence on Churchill's early years. Do you want to comment? Yes, I showed a photo of her when, at the beginning. And uh, Womany or Womany um, was absolutely an emotional anchor for the needy little boy, Winston Churchill, and was devoted to him. There are very sweet stories about how when Winston Churchill was at Harrow, the um, elite boarding school in England, um, he kept begging his mother to, uh, or his father to come and visit him. His father never did, but his mother only very occasionally did. So Mrs. Everest would come and visit him and he treated her like royalty and other boys were amazed to see uh, Winston Churchill escorting uh, this sort of very unpre unpretentious woman who was obviously overawed by all the aristocratic privilege around her, uh, escorting her down the high street and making a big fuss of her. The sad part of the woman knee of the Mrs. Everest story is that she didn't really, Jenny was totally dependent on her. But Mrs. Everest didn't get on with um, the Duchess of Marlborough. And often the Churchills were so broke that they were living with Randolph's parents at Blenheim. And as soon as she was able, as soon as Jack went, to, the younger son went to boarding school, the Duchess of Marlborough sacked Mrs. Everest, said, we don't need you anymore. And at that stage, there was no kind of security for domestic servants. Mrs. Everest at that stage was probably a little too old for most jobs. Jenny did manage to find her another job um, with a, um, a bishop, I think, but uh, she had no security, no pension. And Winston Churchill always kept in touch with her. He still depended on her, but uh, she was given no notice. It was a fairly harsh entrance, uh, ending to the uh, a great relationship. So sad. Mm. Um, did Sarah and Jenny ever meet? Oh, I was convinced when I began the research that they were so often in the same place and moving in the same circles that they would meet. And I just couldn't find it anywhere. Finally, I got to the Churchill archives in Cambridge and there's a wonderful archivist there. And I explained, I asked him, did they ever meet? And he said, well, when Churchill was going to travel to Newfoundland for the hugely important first meeting of these two heads of state in 1941. He and FDR were going to rendezvous at Argentia Bay. Argentia Bay. Um, Churchill wanted every possible piece of ammunition to uh, cement this relationship with uh, the two, with, with Roosevelt. And so he got the uh, all his staff combing archives, combing family papers, to uh, find evidence of such a meeting. And the archivist looked at me and said, and he couldn't find it, Charlotte. So I don't think you're going to find it. Interesting, thank you. I've got another question. Sarah wouldn't let FDR and Eleanor get divorced, but do you think she thought adultery was wrong? I think there was a real, real two, sta two uh, double standards on that. Um, with very different views on male and female sexuality. I mean, a lot was forgiven for men 
that um, was never forgiven for women. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, and once um, the crisis in the Roosevelt marriage was uh, passed, the Franklin's affair with Lucy Mercer was never mentioned again. And it's quite clear that in fact, Franklin went on, on and had affairs with other women too. And there's some suggestion that there was a particular brothel in New York that he used to go to. Um, but uh, Sarah just turned a blind eye to all that. Uh, it was, Sarah would not have approved, no. Um, but at that stage, it was seen as sort of typical male behavior, whereas mm -hmm. affairs were never seen as typical female behavior. You, your book covers a lot of detail. It sort of it gives you a real feeling for the times. How did you sort of decide what to put in and what to leave out? That's the toughest question. I just knew my publishers wouldn't accept a 2,000 page manuscript. So, <laughs> you know, I had to sort of pare the story down to what I thought was most important. Um, and there were chat, I mean, I don't actually write much about the sons because it was, I I wanted to see them through their mother's eyes rather than as has always been done in the past, seeing the mothers through the son's eyes. And so I, I don't, for instance, go through all Churchill's amazing career moves. <laughs> and I don't write a lot about uh, FDR's polio and how he dealt with that. Um, although in each case, you know, those are, I got really fascinated by all that when I was actually reading and doing the research. I wanted to stick very closely to what I'd set out to do, which was to examine these women's lives in their own terms, examine them, what they thought they were doing, what they were enjoying, what, uh, how they were making choices uh, at the time they were living. I didn't want to get distracted by too many other aspects of their lives. Fantastic. Well, I have to say it's been a fabulous interview. Before we end, I just want to say we have a draw, certainly for your book, Charlotte, um, and I, you're going to have to trust me on the, my trusty bowl here. And the winner is Paula Frisch. Oh, so if you want to email me, Paula, that's lovely. And we have two other books that we've actually um, talked about in the past. And we've got two more winners, um, Myrna Friedman and Judy Matthews. So if you're uh, listening today, which I believe you are, please email me and we'll deal with that afterwards. And it's courtesy of Classy Lectures and um, through the help of Ben McNally Books, they'll be shipped out to you. So um, I want to say thank you both for uh, being on today and we hope that you'll be back again. I think we've got lots of other wonderful characters we could talk about. And um, any last thoughts, um, Charlotte, on sort of how women influence their sons and is it a good thing or not? My last thoughts are, first of all, to thank you. This has been such a great conversation. Of course, mothers influence their sons. And what I'm really conscious of is how often mothers are blamed for um, sons going off the rails. And how often, you know, I mean, again, it's a nature versus nurture uh, question that a child is born, as I know, I have three sons, all hugely different from the word go in personality. Um, but the nature of the fe the mother son bond is unique. Yeah. Lovely. I've Helen, any last three sons. Yeah, I've yes. also got three sons. <laughs> Only sons, yeah. I think you're right. It's a very unique bond. There's something very, very special about that relationship. And they're very Love protective. It. it gets to a stage where they actually become very protective of, of their mother. Yes. And concerned for their well-being. It's wonderful, actually. Yeah. Lovely note to end our talk on, I think. Thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. And we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you.